giving you a voice, and making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. We're going to start out with some basics. Um, so how is your guys' team organized as far as personnel, roles, and how different aspects of the team are covered? Um, so our team uh, isn't like other teams. We don't have a defined structure, per se. We don't have, like, four different groups. We have, like, electrical, wiring, programming. We don't have those groups. And, like, you're in that group. You have to stay in that group. And you do what that group is supposed to do, and you don't interact. Um, it's not like that at all. You aren't forced into one role. Um, you can specialize in one role, per se. You can go and you can, like, mainly learn how to program or mainly learn how to do the wiring or how to build the robot. Um, but you don't have to just be in that one area. You can learn how to do multiple things. You could learn how to do everything. It's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort, but you could do that. Um, the way it works is as you come in as a younger student, you get told you find something that you want to do, uh, and you go and you follow that kind of lead student who is more the most experienced in that category they will have all the like lead main uh, students go and do a presentation at the beginning of the year it'll be like programming wiring mechanical etc they do a presentation kind of explaining um, what that role does uh, to help get the robot to the final state competition ready um, and as you sit there you listen you learn hopefully the lead mentor or lead student is going to teach you um, and maybe get you to do some small tasks, like if you're machining, they're going to get you to face uh, a shaft or maybe drill a hole in a shaft. Or um, And as you gain more experience, they'll hopefully get you to do more bigger and you'll have more responsibility kind of thing. Um, yeah. All right. So uh, how do you guys approach funding for your team? Is it mainly sponsorship or fundraising? And, and how do you guys approach that? Uh, so for our team, a lot of it is fundraising from response. Sorry, it's from our sponsors. Uh, so this could be like our local um, companies. So this could be like the Winona's Men's Club or the Rotary Club. Uh, there's also CNC or like some of the bigger companies like CNC Woodcraft, which has been with us since day one. Um, we always encourage our new students to talk to new people to try to get more fundraising because, you know, it's kind of expensive to build a robot. So we always you know, it could also just be in-kind sponsors, which is, you know, uh, like our like the sponsors that cut our sheet metal and our tube metal. You know, it's time on working on those machines that they're giving us that we it's not through money, but it's through running those machines and having people actually cut that out. Uh, there are small we do ask students to pay a fee, which kind of covers travel costs, food. Um, new students get their polos and the shirts and it's. Um, you know, it's we also do some fundraising, which could be selling chocolate bars or uh, helping out at different festivals. But it's I'd say it's mostly about through sponsors that we're able to run the team so well. How do you guys um, just to expand on that a little bit? Like, is there anything specific you guys do uh, when you're looking to uh, approach a new sponsor or, or get that sponsorship money? Is there anything specific you guys do, or do you know? Do you guys cold call them? Do you go visit them? How do you guys kind of go about that? There's there's some cold calling that goes involved, but the the biggest thing that you can do as a team for corporate sponsorship is um, knowing someone who is in a decision making position for securing sponsorship, and that's really the best way to get to get your foot in the door is if you, if you know someone, if you have a contact um, who's uh, in communication with the person who are actually making those decisions, that's, that's the best way to get in with corporate sponsorship. Awesome. Um, all right. So how does your team handle training and educating students, especially newer students and, and how do they kind of develop into being able to contribute in a meaningful way on the team? Um, yeah, so like I said, um, you join a team, you're a new student, um, you immediately get told that if you want to learn something in a specific category or, yeah, if you want to learn something, you go, you find like the head student or someone that has experience in that category and you stick with them and you see what they do and you learn what they do and you ask questions if you have questions. Um, and hopefully, eventually, you'll get more responsibility and you'll be able to learn from experience. Not only that, but one thing that we've started doing this year is SOLIDWORKS training throughout the summer with returning students. 
Um, we began using Discord for communication amongst the entire team because it's uh, really easy to get um, and it works well. Most people <laughs> pay attention to it. Uh, but one of the big challenges um, with training is having access to the school throughout the summer and having mental availability. Um, with this Discord, we can have all of the students and mentors in the comfort of their home, uh, sitting in front of their own computers, and we can have them do SOLIDWORKS training without the need to meet at the school or some other local position. Um, it also allows us to record these sessions in case there's a student that misses a session or, yeah. Awesome. Um, so uh, what kinds of things do you guys do both during the season and also in the off season to help other teams in your area, uh, as well as just the community overall? And, and how do these improve your team and students? Uh, so the big thing that we do is our 2056 Ways to Inspire conference. So we've been doing it for a couple years now, and it's we invite a bunch of speakers um, from various different fields in the FIRST community to talk about anything from programming an FRC robot uh, starting a te an FRC team, running an FLL team, um, strategic design, some main chairmen, and they all come in and talk to these people. And it can be, and it's an event, so anyone can come. It's Saturday in September. Uh, it's hosted at our school, so you can come in and kind of check out our facilities. And it's all about just trying to sharing different knowledge from different parts of the community with everyone. And if you're unable to go, or if you're one looking back at previous years, we do have every um, all the presentations posted on our website where you can go and view them. Awesome. Um, so moving on to kind of how the team operates, you know, for the competition itself. So how does your team approach kickoff, um, and what does your team do that you think results in a more successful season compared to other teams? Kind of anything that differentiates you. Um. One of the, the biggest things that we do to have a successful season uh, is that we have all the students be as prepared as possible and they all come to kickoff. We meet at the old Stony Creek Hall. Um, we live in Stony Creek, that's where we are, and we used to just be a city, um, but the city hall has turned into a library. So we go there every year, we meet up and we have the entire team, mentors, parents, students, new students, we have everyone show up and we all watch the video. Uh, and we come up with ideas right there of how to design it um, and what we kind of prioritize. Um, and as I kind of talked about earlier, we do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer mentorship in the fall. Um, we have students teaching other students what they know uh, and getting them to kind of start out and you kind of get to figure out what you want to do uh, before the season actually starts. Um, I think our team relies a lot on the seniors to pass on the things that they learned from old students, uh, not graduated students, um, and I think it goes well. We don't have a lot of mentor supervision kind of thing. Like, we definitely do, but I think there's a lot, it's a lot of students to students. Um, also, competing at a high level in FRC requires a marathon effort that spans four months. Um, but with the removal of bag day to stay ultra competitive, we are going to have to work even harder and harder because there's no set point of where you can keep on going and then you have to stop on this day. You can keep on going until your first competition. So I think the, the robot's going to be a lot more competitive and it's going to take a lot more time and a lot more effort and energy from everyone. All right. Um, what does your guys' team do? So this is kind of more focused on once we're at the events and competition. Uh, how does your guys' team approach scouting? Um, and how do you utilize the information that you get then gather from the scouting? Uh, so scouting is done um, by students. In previous years, we used paper, but more recently, we've moved on to using an app. So uh, it's an app we build each year because, you know, each game is different each year. And so it's... Uh, so the we have six one watching robot, including ourselves, uh, and they're tracking things like time. So, um, what's the cycle time for a robot to pick up a hatch and score it on a lock, or to pick up a cargo and score it in the cargo ship? And that's also in counting. Um, you can add like different things, like are they being defended? Are they defending? Did they drop it? Um, did they die? And all those different things. And then we also have um, our head teacher who's recording our matches with a tablet and so then after every single match uh we bring that back to the pit and we review you know what happened what was good what maybe happened that we need to fix or look out for next time uh it's and then you know we bring all that data to collect 
um, from the scouts. The scouts are a very, very big part of the team. It's a very, very tough job because you're sitting in the stands for so long. And we have a scouting meeting, you know, before we pick our alliance. And we're looking through this massive spreadsheet of data from all the different teams that competed. And we're looking at both the statistics as well as, you know, uh, like what type of team it might be. So like if it's a team we've worked with a lot, we, you know, we know them a little bit more personably and it's a little bit, uh, it's something that we might be able to, it might be a little bit easier to talk with them, I guess. I'm not trying to, I'm not saying it's wrong. It's like, we, we of course try to work with a lot of new teams, but you know, if we know a team, we might be able to talk a little bit about, it's like, oh, we know that this driver we've worked with before. And it's, you know, we look at everything from the data to the driver to the team. It's, you know, it's scouting is a very big, big part of how we plan our matches and scouting. Hey, Sarah, could you uh, caption this picture a little bit for us? So we're going to have it on screen. It's, it has uh, a bunch of your teammates with a bunch of QR codes on different sized devices. What's going on there? Yeah. So uh, how the app worked is so we didn't have like a server running because, you know, no Wi-Fi. Uh, we had it that you, our scouts would scan a QR code um, and that would mm -hmm. connect it to like the main computer. And that's how the data was sent around. So you yeah, never every, had to upload or download ever. Yeah, every match, um, every match is recorded um, on the tablet of what each team's cycle times was, when they picked up, when they dropped off, whether they dropped the game piece, whatever. All of that data is encoded into a QR code, and then there's one central uh, device that then scans the six QR codes for the six robots in that match, and then that data gets um, saved into a Excel spreadsheet that's sortable. So it gives us this kind of visual network, so to speak, um, but it allows us to do the data transfer without having to set up hotspots and run Ethernet cables and do all kinds of goofy stuff to avoid, you know, doing things that are illegal. So we thought the that QR codes was kind of cool. That is super smart. I'm going to have our students deal that. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, one of our last questions, uh, what would you guys attribute most to your team finding so much consistency in the success that you guys have had over the years? That's a good question. Um, we have some core pillars. I think we have a few core um, robust, simple, and effective. Uh, and each year we try and follow these three core pillars. Um, and I think each year we do that well. We make sure that our robot is simple. We don't over-design. We don't over-complicate moving game pieces or we don't over-complicate our drive train. We make everything nice and we make it simple. We make it robust. We make it nice and strong. Nothing's going to break. Um, if something does break, we're usually prepared for it. We have we make a bunch of backups, um, and I think that really helps uh, with keeping our team consistent. All right. Yeah, sir. Did you want to add on? Uh, I guess it's also like you know, it's a lot of effort between the students and the teachers, and that you know we're we've been given a great opportunity with our teacher in our school that we are able to work those late nights coming in on the weekends to work hard it's all about the students effort that they put into the team and it's that the fact that everyone's working so hard that we're able to produce such a great robot awesome um so for for our last question before we start hitting some of the questions submitted by uh our community beforehand um and before our first giveaway uh tyler do you want to talk and, and maybe show some things about your team's cad process and, and maybe how you guys approach design i know you have some uh, some screen share you can uh show the audience yeah so we're a very very heavily cad driven team um, we pretty well cad a hundred percent of the machine before we build anything and um i would say 90 percent of the design changes we make throughout the season also get uh, get designed uh, before they get fabricated, unless it's like some little goofy change, a zip tie a thing or put a bracket on or whatever. 90, 95% of stuff gets catted before, uh, before it gets fabricated. So, um, I mean, here's the CAD model of this year's robot and um, literally everything down to the sponsor panels was um, design before it was fabricated. Um, 
So we, we use uh, largely uh, sheet metal and uh, tubing uh, construction. Um, I could go on at length about this, but... Uh, can you well? Can you maybe talk about you know? Do you guys so do you, when you guys design the whole robot? Do you do you break it into sub assemblies and and is that assigned to different people or you know how how do how do you guys approach getting the entire robot catted? Because I know a lot of teams struggle with having the bandwidth to do that. Yeah, and that that's something that every team has to figure out. Um, figure out what level that they want to CAD that works for them because a lot of teams can get into this CAD bottleneck where they spend so much time um, trying to get every nitty gritty detail perfect. And then they run out of time to actually build the thing. Um, what the, what teams need to figure out is what CAD resources they actually have and design, design around that. So if, if you're a team and maybe, maybe you, you just CAD your gripper. Or maybe you just CAD your elevator and you don't worry about the drivetrain because you can use a kit apart chassis. Those are things that teams need to figure out before the season. And um, the ability to design within uh, your resources is is a big thing that a lot of teams miss the mark on. And that's where we're seeing like uh, um, this minimum competitive concept is such a great thing for so many teams. Is it, it provides an option that's within their resources that uh, just about any team could build and and be successful. So, um, and and maybe as one last. Oh no, go ahead. To your question, how do we how do we break that down? It really depends on what um, what our resources are on a given year, um, and what students uh, we have that are interested in CAD, um, and what their skill levels are, um, what our mentor availability is and uh and a lot of things like that so it, it varies from year to year um about which subsystems get designed by what what groups um and there isn't a hard and fast answer to it but um, we're a team with a lot of cad horsepower that can get a lot of stuff done very quickly um so we spread it out if we can and if we can't then well we put our heads down and plow through it <laughs> So, and then maybe one last follow up on this before we move on um, is how much how much prototyping goes into all your different systems. So, I mean, obviously some are prototyped more than others, um, but like you know, for your gripper, for example, I mean, do you guys end up having a prototype that is pretty close to what the competition version ends up being, or do you guys just kind of jump in on design from the beginning and and then go from there? Or, you know, how do you approach that? Um, I don't. We don't do a lot of physical prototyping we don't build like a wooden gripper but we take inspiration from like robot in three days they we look at them and we see what they do and, and if we have an idea that they've implemented we can see this is a, a good idea and we're going to continue doing this kind of our way or we can see that it didn't really work for them we can still consider it but we might want to look at um, other things and even while we're actually building it we might um, test it as we're making it and we might find that for example this year uh, the fingers um, they weren't holding on to the panel uh, as tightly as we kind of wanted um, so we kind of had to change their shape a little bit uh, as we were building it um, yeah we need your help to keep fun at loud live and independent Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live, and independent. Pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now.